I'm going to be returning to some things which I have addressed in the past. Um, that being the subject of evolution and atheism. Um, I had a few comments in one of my old videos from a someone who wants to describe herself, I'm assuming it's a she, um, as a young Christian, although it's pretty obvious that this person is a young earth creationist um, and is very much opposed to the idea of evolution. She wants to remain anonymous because I think she worries about people taking the mick in the comment section. And um, so I will just start by reading um, <coughs> the first part of quite a long comment, which is just a barrage of questions, um, which I think are somewhat wrong-headed and demonstrate a misunderstanding of what evolution is. Um, before I start that, i um, just like to address the atheist thing. Um, I've, in the last well, roughly four years, um, I've been reluctant to self-describe as an atheist, not so much because of the technicalities of not believing gods are real, um, but more because the way people define what they think God is varies so widely that some descriptions of what God is um, would overlap with some of the things I think are true. That's not to say that I am unskeptical about religious claims or paranormal or anything supernatural. I'm still a very skeptical person, but I think that calling myself calling myself agnostic is more accurate. Um, I'm agnostic about whether there was an intelligent first cause of the universe or not. I just simply don't know. So anyway, here's the first part of the question from this anonymous YouTube person. What came first? The digestive system? The food to be digested? The appetite? The ability to find food? The digestive juices? Or the body's own resistance to its digestive juices? Um, first of all, it's really only the lining of the stomach and the digestive system itself which is resistant to um, being damaged by digestive juices. Um, but the question itself, um, it's a little bit like the old what came first, the chicken or the egg. Um, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. You can't pick out one of those things and say that came first and the others didn't. The idea behind evolution is that complexity gradually arose from simplicity over multiple generations, over very long periods of time. Now, the person I'm addressing um, does believe that the Earth and presumably the universe is only 6,000 years old, which obviously doesn't give nearly enough time for these things to happen. There aren't, isn't enough time for enough generations for the small changes which we observe happening to manifest themselves completely. Um, so I'll maybe come back to some of that in further questions. The next question is, how did random chaos know how to evolve in order to survive? Um, that itself is another, it's, it's a loaded question, it has a lot of, a lot of things are assumed in the question itself. First of all, random chaos, <coughs> excuse me, the, <coughs> excuse me again, I've got a bit of a cold. Random chaos, um, it's, that within evolutionary theory there is an element of randomness, um, there in sexual um, reproduction there is a mixing up of the DNA from the male and female parents and that is 
uh, divided, as far as I understand, more or less randomly. Um, which is why siblings are different from each other. There's variation among siblings. Um, some are more like the father, some are more like the mother. Um, but back to the question, how did random chaos know how to evolve in order to survive? See, random chaos knowing something, it implies um, an intelligent agent behind it, which... Um, as far as evolutionary theory is concerned um, part of the whole point is that there is no uh, agent there, there is no agency behind it it is a natural process something which happens um, just in a particular way it uh, changes from one generation to the next are cumulative and they build on existing platforms what is already there changes a little bit from one generation to the next and then changes a little bit more from you know every subsequent generation and the this is largely well, it has a lot to do with the environment in which the organisms plant animal fungus bacteria wherever whatever it is um Whatever slight variations um, help that individual or group of individuals to survive for long enough to reproduce and pass on their traits to their offspring, um, that's what is carried on. Um, how did random chaos know how to evolve in order to survive? See, it implies an intelligent agent, which there isn't. Um, that's not part of the theory. That, by the way, does not um, mean that there is no God who may be involved uh, to a greater or a lesser extent, either right at the very beginning or during the process. Um, I don't go down that road myself, um, but it's worth pointing out that um, there are millions, hundreds of millions probably, of uh, devout Christians who are fully on board with the Earth being 4.6 billion years old and evolution happening, just the way scientists say. Being a scientist does not um, automatically mean a person is atheist, atheistic. Um, the, I think it was Stephen Jay Gould described religion and science as non-overlapping magisteria, I think he has a point to a certain degree, um, but it's only when aspects of religion um, make false claims about science or misrepresent it, then the whole thing starts to run into trouble. And with young Earth creationists in particular, such as this person I'm responding to, there seems to be a... Um, a, a, a lack of understanding of how, how the scientific method works and they assume that their particular interpretation of a particular religion is the only correct one. Um, some of the young earth creationists admit that there are other Christians who believe that, you know, who are on board with evolution and geologic time, the, the, the whole time scale, which um, evolutionary theory does require um, but then we, we go down a whole series of other avenues describing how we know that the earth is more than 6,000 years old I've already covered some of this in previous videos um, if anyone is interested anyway so back to the next question how could nothing make everything we are talking about no gravity, no air, no energy, no cells, no anything to start off with. This is another thing. It's the sort of fundamental axiomatic way that a lot of um, what I would call hardcore young earth creationists, the way they see the world, um, they just, in, in all the questions they ask, they assume that there must be an agent behind everything. Um, there may be, there may be not, but they, they also assume that the agent must be, must fit in with their 
categorical way of thinking. So how could nothing make everything? Um, it's, you know, here we're straying way, you know, away from evolutionary theory, which deals with the biological diversity of life and dissent with modification. Evolutionary theory is something which deals with life which already exists and describes how changes between generations um, manifest in, you know, larger and larger differences over periods of time, long periods of time, and it also implies common ancestry. So, and even the young earth creationists have to be on board with this to a certain degree, um, because they generally talk about the Noah's Ark story as literally happening four and a half thousand years ago, which, uh, and, and because of the limitations of the size of this boat, they well understand that you can only get a certain number of species on board, uh, or kinds as they like to describe it, which means in order to have the vast number of species we see today, um, they talk about dog kind or cat kind or crocodile kind and say, oh, all modern crocodiles um, had common ancestors four and a half thousand years ago. Um, same with cats or horses, donkeys, zebras, you, you name it. All these kinds that they describe um, had to have evolved much more rapidly than evolutionary theory would postulate in four and a half thousand years. So if it can be shown, if it can be explained to these young earth creationists that the earth isn't young, um, it's much much older than they think and there are many many um, independent lines of reasoning which point towards this, then they could start to get a better understanding of what evolutionary theory actually is and not fall for the trap of um, straw manning the thing. So yes, back to this. How could nothing make everything? We are, as I said, straying outside of evolutionary theory and going into cosmology and the Big Bang theory, um, which is badly named, I would say. Um, the, the Big Bang Theory comes from Fred Hoyle, an English astronomer, I think in the 50s or 60s. I, I, I'm not exactly sure when it was, but many decades ago, um, he wasn't too keen on the idea of um, the expansion of the universe, so he called it the Big Bang Theory, and for some reason that name stuck, when what it really means is it's a de description of the expansion of the universe and extrapolating backwards in time. And, you know, we observe the universe to be expanding today. You run the tape backwards, um, everything became closer together, hotter and denser. Um, and using the known laws of physics, it's amazing how much can be calculated about how the universe originated. Um, and you know, with fairly basic physics and chemistry, we know what's going on inside stars. We know how elements are formed, um, ultimately from hydrogen atoms, um, and this nuclear fusion, stellar, nu stellar nucleosynthesis. All fascinating stuff, which I'm uh, certainly not an expert in, um, and I don't have time to talk about it in great detail here now but uh, well worth looking into. Um, how could nothing make everything? We, uh, it didn't. Um, nothing make everything implies intention, a creative intention behind it. Um, I do, I, again, I think that's a wrong-headed way of looking at it. Um, we are talking about no gravity, no air, no energy, no cells, no anything to start off with. Um, there's a lot of jumping about in here, you know. The actual understanding of how um, the universe progressed, um, starting off with the expansion of the universe, which um, 
I don't think anybody has a really good idea of exactly how things started at the very beginning, but from a fraction of a second after um, what you might call the singularity, um, a lot of the rest of what happened is pretty well understood. Um, so things like cells, um, you know, happened much later on in the process. You first have to have stellar nucleosynthesis. You have to have very large stars going supernova. Um, and that causes the um, simpler atoms to fuse into more complex atoms. Um, so from hydrogen, helium, and then, you know, lithium, um, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, the sort of things that we are made out of and our planet is made out of. And then in uh, second generation supernova, you get the much heavier elements, titanium, gold, uranium, all of those things. Uh, obviously, I'm not an expert in this. Um, nor am I an expert in evolutionary theory, but I like to think that it's possible for me to help some people who really don't understand it at all well to get a slightly better understanding of it. So that's all I'm going to respond to right now. Um, I may come back to this. Hopefully the person who asked those questions begins to have a slightly better understanding of how these things work according to the scientists who actually study these subjects and um, thank you for watching and see you next time